Hi, I'm Dr. Elaine Siegfried. Today I'm joined by my colleagues, Assistant Professor Dr. Nevis Pustacek and Professor Andreas Wallenberg. So let's start with disease severity and family impact of pediatric atopic dermatitis. I'll start with a little overview of the epidemiology and symptom burden in this disease. So the epidemiology is fairly consistent worldwide. It's estimated at somewhere between 3 and 20 percent worldwide in the population. The disease burden is significant. It's really marked by impaired quality of life, cognitive impairment, mental illness problems, especially hyperactivity, impaired family relationships, psychological stressors, and really all marked by profound sleep disturbance in affected children. There have been a, a variety of validated measures that have looked at quality of life, the impact of atopic dermatitis and quality of life in pediatric patients, used mostly in clinical trials. I'm most familiar with the CDLQI, but there are a variety of other ones that have been validated. And in some countries, they're actually used to justify uh, more aggressive treatment in children. Mainstay of treatment has always been topical therapy, but there are a significant and really increasingly well-recognized proportion of children who deserve systemic treatment or aggressive treatment in, uh, for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Several publications have addressed this and really looking at how you assess the severity and the burden of childhood atopic dermatitis to help support medical decision-making for going from topical to systemic therapy. Most of these publications recommend a comprehensive review of the impact on quality of life and stru psychological stressors. We're gonna be talking a little bit more about the details about how you do this. Let's move to our panel discussion. I'm gonna invite my colleagues to discuss some questions submitted by our pre-canvassed audience. How do you two assess quality of life burden in patients with atopic dermatitis? Let's start with you, Dr. Vollenberg. I speak to the family which is the caregivers who attend and the child, if that is possible. And I'm trying to find out with a few simple questions and the mood where we stand. Um, for documentation purposes, uh, usually the uh, CDLQI, or the Children's um, Dermatology Life Quality Index, is a thing to document. But we use it more for documentation for payers than to do a medical decision. I like to quantify sleep. Don't you think that's an important one? I, I, I really quantify how long does it take you to, how many nights a week do you have problems falling asleep? How long does it take you to fall asleep? How many times a night do you wake up? Sleep disturbance uh, really influence the quality of life enormously. Emotional problems, mood changes, lack of concentrations, chronic fatigue, behavioral problems can develop. And if uh, children don't sleep, neither do parents, so which affects uh, family quality of life a lot. School absenteeism is another one that you can easily quantify. How many days of school have you missed in the last month, in the last semester? Yeah. We like in Germany the scorat a lot, and there are two questions addressing the subjective burden of disease. Uh, they go for the itch, and they go for the sleeplessness. Uh, so sleep disturbance is usually quantified on a zero to 10, um, either visual analog scale or a numerical rating scale. And um, that is usually done by proxy so that the parents would give some information, or if you have adolescents, uh, we let them answer themselves. It's a very easy but uh, very useful tool for us, um, and we recall those numbers usually in the patient chart. And what's, what else can be very frustrating? Uh, treatment is exhausting. Um, atopic dermatitis is time-consuming disease, so more than two hours a day is needed uh, for proper skin care and uh, use of emollients. Uh, and what else can be frustrating? Other people's comments and advice. Uh, people give advice in their best attention to help, but sometimes their advice make parents and patients feel guilty. They don't do enough to help their baby or to help themselves. Yes, I think our international experience is all shared in that regard. Moving on to how do you decide when somebody has failed topical treatment and they deserve systemic, more aggressive systemic approaches, Dr. Wallenberg. 
In clinical reality with my patients, I usually do this on a um, soft scale basis. I'm trying to get information about the disturbances in daily life, about um, the problems with participating uh, with the activities of the peer group that is, of course, age dependent, um, with the subjective burden, with the problems with attending school, with the problems uh, to have uh, with the treatment. And um, I gather a lot of information. Uh, there are a few things that we take as a, let's say, benchmark. And these are the three key opening gates for systemic therapy. One is a classical score definition. It's a score rate above 50. The patient is there, we say, just because of severity of disease, uh, we feel that systemic treatment here is needed. Uh, but some people who are not in that high score rate range still have a problem because either uh, the topic of therapy uh, will fail to give the desired result, or uh, even in spite of the therapy, the participation um, in the social activities is not possible. So either of these gate openers to systemic therapy is there, and that is why we are so happy that all our drugs are licensed for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Most, almost all people with severe atopic dermatitis really need systemic treatment, and usually it's the patient's wish not to receive it. With the moderate patients, uh, some of them ask for it. Sometimes we say, we try topicals a lot, it doesn't help. And then uh, we need to have a good reason, especially for the payers, to say why this patient needs it. And then we go ahead with uh, all the moderate patients who have one of those gate openers present. Yes. And before starting the systemic treatment, it is important to rule out the differential diagnosis. Uh, for example, trigger factors such as allergic contact dermatitis or behavioral and educational reasons for poor responses. Uh, we do not have to forget about corticophobia. Some patients, some parents are afraid of topical corticosteroid treatment. So it's important to talk with them, to educate them, to ask them, what do you think, what will happen uh, when you use topical corticosteroids and give them some uh, information, some scientific fact. For example, there is um, different studies that show that early aggressive treatment with topical corticosteroids since early childhood followed by proactive treatment can reduce the incidence of food allergy at the age of two. Yes, I completely agree with you, especially about the differential diagnosis and making sure that we're recognizing occult allergic contact dermatitis or a variety of occult infections that can really trigger this disease. Uh, I call it herpes incognito. Really, in the United States, we see a lot of occult tinea capitis, especially in some patient populations, just to make sure that there's not that. And then, and you know, primary immunodeficiencies can also contribute. I do think fortunately that some of the systemic treatments that we have like targeted biologics are really effective for people who have some immune system dysfunction that can increase their risk for infections. But on the other hand, a more primary immune suppressive drugs like cyclosporin or methotrexate or even JAK inhibitors are less appropriate for that patient population. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I think it's, it's quite clear that uh, the key differential diagnosis uh, of the childhood age is uh, an unrecognized uh, primary immunodeficiency. There are some of them. Uh, the DOC8 deficiency probably being the most relevant for me, at least in my setting. As you mentioned, Dr. Vollenberg, patients are all, often requesting systemic treatment, but there are a subset of patients who are pretty resistant to using systemic treatment. So how do you address those families who are resistant to uh, really giving a good chance for more effective treatment for their kids? Um, I'm trying to speak quite openly like I would do uh, with a family member. Uh, I give the pros, I give the cons, and I ask which ones are relevant. And I'm trying to listen what comes back. Sometimes it's 
uh, that a relative or um, someone from the kindergarten or someone whom they met has told them about a danger of systemic therapy. So they are afraid of something that upon a closer look is an irrational fear. So it's relatively easy to address it. Um, but you need to listen. You need to find out what is the reason that would put them. We can give a few medical reasons that are for it and against it, but we must blend with the patient's uh, hopes, fears, and beliefs. Yeah, it's the most important thing is education. Uh, parents are afraid of systemic treatment. And then it's important to tell them that we are talking not about the inflammation in the skin, but systemic inflammation with all its consequences. Atopic dermatitis goes far beyond the rash on the skin. It's systemic inflammation, moderate and severe atopic dermatitis with its consequences, atopic and non-atopic comorbidities. And as professor said, uh, unanswered questions create fear and that leads to abandon the treatment they don't fully understand. Yes, absolutely addressing the uh, extracutaneous complications and the importance of treatment for that. And also my soundbite for that is you don't want to take a treatment, use a treatment that's higher risk than the disease, but you can't ignore the risk of the disease. Hi, I'm Dr. Elaine Siegfried. Today I'm joined by my colleagues, Assistant Professor Dr. Nevis Pusticek and Professor Andreas Wallenberg. We're going to talk a little bit more about how you step up care in pediatric atopic dermatitis. In the United States and in Europe, there are several systemic treatments that are now approved to treat moderate to severe pediatric atopic dermatitis. In the United States, dupilumab is approved for treatment of moderate to severe pediatric dermatitis in patients all the way down to six months of age. Options in the EU that are approved are dupilumab and the anti-IL-13 biologics lebrikizumab and trelokinumab. There are also JAK inhibitor options in the United States that are FDA approved, abrocitinib and apatacitinib, as well as apatacitinib in the EU. This is an illustration of the relative efficacy of the three biologic agents that are available. And I just want to point out that direct comparison between these trials should really not be made because the trial designs are really different. You can see that they're all really pretty similar at uh, 12 weeks and 16 weeks across all age groups. Similarly, you can look at the efficacy of JAK inhibitors in a 12-week trial, that's the abrocitinib trial, and a 16-week trial of apatacitinib where the efficacies are similar, looking at improvement in the EZ75 scores uh, at these, at these uh, primary time points. A and again, pretty similar in the 60% range. This is another graphic looking at the long-term extension data for agents in pediatric patients with atopic dermatitis. And again, these trials really can't be directly compared because the trial designs are different. But what I want to emphasize here is that we do have long-term data for all of these drugs and looking at really good efficacy that's sustained over long periods of time. So for my two colleagues, what's your real-world experience with these drugs? Do you have uh, favorites? Do you uh, think that one is more effective or safer than the other? If we look at the different options that we have, um... Key questions are if you want to use an injectable or if you want to use an oral drug. Uh, there are key differences regarding uh, the first approach to taking it. The adherence is usually better with subcutaneous injection if you compare to orals. Uh, the orals uh, have a better flexibility of dosing, which is easily done. So we have different aspects. There are less things to control if you go for a type 2 blocker. So for us, it's more difficult to do uh, blood checks with children than to do subcutaneous injections. In the end, it's a complex issue. Uh, I like both types of drugs. Um, if I have to do a quick intervention to go through a flare, I clearly prefer the JAK inhibitors because they work faster. Um, if it goes for a drug-drug interaction, if it goes for easiness of use, 
um, I prefer uh, the injectables. And especially if we have someone who has an asthma comorbidity, this is a very good reason to go specifically for the topilumab. Yes, I agree with Professor Wallenberg. And um, in Croatia, we have to start first with systemic immunosuppressants and then switch to biologics or JAK inhibitors. We do not have tralokinumab and jabrokizumab. And uh, dupilumab has a sa good safety profile, so no laboratory monitoring is needed. Um, the most common side effects is conjunctivitis and blepharitis, rarely indication for discontinuation of the treatment, uh, injection site reaction, and uh, head and neck erythema. And that's, as I re read, the, the same with lebrokizumab and tralokinumab. And for JAX, um, um, pros for JAX are uh, for upatacitinib, our oral formulation, low cost, possibility of therapy modulation, you can stop and then start the treatment and uh, a very uh, uh, rapid uh, onset of action also. But uh, what can be a problem along safety profile? Nibas, I completely agree with what you said. And with the conjunctivitis, I want to add the fact that um, the other type 2 blockers would also have that, but at a, a lower uh, incidence rate compared to dupi. And in addition, all the children have a lower incidence compared to the adults. So no matter of what we look at, what we learn from the adult patients, and I'm seeing both children and adults, um, the conjunctivitis is much less a problem for the children at least in my hands and also in the trials. My experience as well that I, I have a, just a very small number of children who had any issues with conjunctivitis, mm -hmm. only one who had to discontinue the drug. Andreas, you mentioned the difference between an oral formulation and an injectable. And while it doesn't seem like that should be a big deal for most patients, I think for, for some who have severe needle phobia, it does make a difference. Although for all the oral medications, you still have to do blood monitoring, whereas for the uh, parenteral medications, you really don't have to do that. So I always try to help people understand that as well. I do think that the oral medications and the primary immune suppressants that are standard of care, older treatments, are generally quicker onset, except for methotrexate, which also takes that 12 to 16 weeks to kick in. But uh, so, you know, for, for acute improvement, I think that's, a, that's an argument to be made for those medications. But I personally have such suspicions and concerns about long-term treatment with immune suppressants like JAK inhibitors that I really do stick with the more targeted biologic agents when, when you're gonna need long-term control. Do you both feel the same way? We use uh, in children some destruction methods for, for needle phobia. For example, uh, 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 watching video or uh, singing, uh, uh, listen to the music. Uh, um, and for uh, older children and adolescents, we can use cognitive behavioral therapy that is called the step-by-step -step exposure. And during the exposure, we practice deep abdominal breathing and visualization technique to um, get rid of uh, phobia. I think those are useful. In the United States, we have those uh, very fancy, expensive auto injectors. Yes. Uh, I have found, though, that uh, there's really variable acceptance of those. Many people prefer the pre-filled syringes. And then one of the first questions that many parents have about these systemic treatments is, how long do I need to be on it? Am I ever going to be able to get off of it? What do you tell patients about that? We, I usually tell them, we hope the treatment is not for life, but the approach is very individual. And when uh, we reach its remission and the patient is well for some time, I personally try to skip the treatment. So for example, for Jax, I uh, give it every second or every third day. And if a topic dermatitis comes back, then return to every day. This is something that's still in the field of the physician's experience and feeling. Um, I learn 
and I tried to um, get information from other fields, and this is the proactive treatment that has been mentioned by Nevis before, where we say someone with a moderate disease, we should question maybe after half a year uh, with a check for withdrawal, and with the severe patients, maybe after two years. This is roughly the same time where I start thinking, do I still need the drug? Um, and uh, this is also somewhat in line if you have food allergy and you do a very strict diet, after a few years, you should ask yourselves, do I still need it? And then you can check if you still need it. But um, for me, the question to uh, stop the treatment is something that depends on the disease severity that we have to handle. How do you both approach tapering off of biologics? Do you increase the duration between injections? Do you decrease the dose? And what's the, if you increase the duration between injections, how long do you go without worrying about, for example, anti-drug antibody formation? We have relatively good data about anti-drug antibodies for the dupilumab, the incidence of the uh, anti-drug antibodies, and that increases uh, if you increase the injection intervals. Um, I think if you go for three weeks, um, nothing serious would happen. Um, at four weeks, you start to, to, to feel something. I wouldn't increase too much because the risk increases. And uh, it's a very helpful drug, so you don't want to have it in a, in a setting where you lose the ability uh, to have it. But again, uh, the, the problem size is much smaller if you compare to the old um, psoriatic drugs that we had uh, that were not uh, fully human in structure. Um, so the, the drugs that we now have, especially the Tupilumab, where we have good data, we know that the overall um, incidence of anti-drug antibodies is much lower compared uh, to the old drugs that were initiated 15 years ago for other diseases. Are there any biomarkers that either of you use to predict comparatively getting better and being able to wean or taper off drugs? The, the only ones that we have in the United States that are readily available are things that are not great biomarkers like total IgE or even eosinophil counts that I think, you know, mark the kids with the more severe disease. And sometimes I monitor those and look at changes over time. Do either of you use any biomarkers like that? Unfortunately, we do not have biomarkers in Croatia for everyday practice, but there are so many biomarkers in the research phase and it will be great when we have biomarkers that will tell us better start with biologic or better start with JAX or it's time to stop the treatment. If there is a patient where there is not a single scratch mark and they say their itch is at 10, worst possible, we start to think if the scale is well balanced. So those um, markers are for me, for the time being, much more important than any of the lab values. I do check from time to time the eosinophils, which may not even be elevated when we start treating, and I check on longer term, from time to time, the IgE, which is usually reduced if you do treatment. There is also very good data from dupilumab. Yes, I think we all agree that looking at the patient is, you know, one of the advantages of having a, a dermatology type of evaluation. And we don't really have to look at the labs. We have to look at the patient more than the labs. But I do think sometimes labs will help us reflect, especially with the extracutaneous uh, immune dysfunction that is type 2 disease. Hi, I'm Dr. Elaine Siegfried. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues, Assistant Professor Dr. Nevis Pustacek and Professor Andreas Wallenberg. Let's move on to our last section, which is optimizing care pathways in pediatric atopic dermatitis. Several strategies for ensuring effective management have been described, and it may be a little bit different from, from infancy to adolescence to young adults. 
with, especially having to do with increasing that responsibility, how you transition care from parents managing most of the disease to assuming that responsibility in young adults. I have a lot of sound bites that I use to try to help uh, patients with uh, you know, how they take care of this disease and then how they transition responsibility of the disease from parent to child. What do you two do? I uh, always, I always educate parents, work on family balance, focus on health, not the disease, and limit the effect of the disease on daily life. So do not talk about the topic dermatitis all day. Uh, share the duties, share the responsibilities, do not neglect the other siblings and create an empowering environment which uh, gives a peace. And for uh, children and adolescents, it is important to encourage spending time with uh, friends, sports and hobbies, also work on health. And it is important to teach children to recognize uh, other people's curiosity People are naturally curious. They ask questions. Uh, why, did, why, why did you miss school again? What is on your skin? Is it contagious? They're sometimes afraid that the, uh, you, that the skin is contagious. So they, uh, it's important to give them the information and good explanation. In the setting of a normal patient consultation, um, it is difficult for time reasons to address all possible fears and uh, wrong beliefs that a patient or a caregiver might have. Uh, therefore, we usually do a combined approach in my institution. Uh, we ask for things that the patients want to share actively and we address them. We give, on the other hand, the advert handout to address the most common questions about atopic dermatitis. This thing fits on a single sheet of A4 paper and we give it out very liberally to anyone coming with the disease. We tell them you will probably know 60% of the things on that page, but just read it and maybe there are a few things that are new and those ones are the most important ones. We have this translated in so many languages. Uh, it's very helpful. Um, so combination of talking and giving simple handouts that are very good in quality. That is for me the key. With regards to transitioning care from having parents assume most of the responsibility to children assuming more responsibility, at what age do you do that? And how young a child do you think is uh, appropriate to start doing self-injection? Some of my patients that are about 10 years of age uh, already did it in a very professional and good way. Um, others would have their own time point when they say, now I want to take over responsibility for every aspect of my treatment. So that's a highly individual decision. Sometimes I still remember a patient whom I took care of from the very beginning and um, she didn't want her mother to inject her, um, but then we agreed that her older sister could do it, which was for her, for some reason, a good way. And we started and that went in a perfect way. So people are so different. Uh, there is no specific age when you should press them to do. It comes naturally. Um, and when they want to have it, then you just go. Uh, so transition is needed, but transition is highly individual. You know, absolutely. But I also think, and I've seen patients who are of the age where they're ready to go off, move out away from home and go off to college, and they absolutely can't do any of their care. And I don't think a year is enough to transition care, meaning, you know, age 16, 17. I usually start mentioning it by the time kids get to early puberty, about 12, you know, and begin to transition some of that responsibility. Do you agree? Well, in, in, in Croatia, until 18 years of age, uh, children and adolescents are taken care by pediatric 
dermatologist with atopic dermatitis. And when they reach 18, we uh, switch them to the dermatologist uh, for adults. Patient. Yeah. Oh, and so do you, we, you know, we have that same issue, you know, the transition of care that we typically do at 18 in the United States from our children's hospital. But sometimes it's difficult to find practitioners who, ha you know, have experience with this. I think increasingly now that we have, you know, such availability of really effective and safe systemic treatments, it's a little bit easier. Um, but, but we do the same thing. I'm going to move on to a little bit more specific questions, questions that really don't have an answer, but definitely have some experiential uh, opinion that, that is, um, could be informative. And what do you do about vaccine administration in young children on schedule for both the live and the killed vaccines? Well, before start biologics and JAK inhibitor therapy, it is recommended to first uh, complete immunization for pediatric patients with all necessary vaccines according to the current guidelines based on the age. And for a live vaccine, they should not be administered with biologic and JAK inhibitors, but uh, patient receiving biologics or JAK inhibitors can simultaneously receive uh, inactive or non-live vaccine. Well, you know, in our experience, there's there's what the specific recommendations should be, and then there's the real world challenge yeah. of that. And in the clinical trials, we actually had several children who were exposed to live virus vaccines. Uh, that was a protocol violation, but in retrospective review of those children, you know, they all did very well with no adverse effects. Um, I think there's really got it to draw a distinction between uh, JAK inhibitors and immunosuppressants and the targeted biologic agents, which at least in theory uh, should enhance efficacy as well as safety of live virus vaccines. And I'm looking forward to seeing more data, you know, that really supports that opinion. In our discussion, in many of the topics that we've covered, you know, we're tending to kind of lump together JAK inhibitors with targeted biologic agents, and they're clearly differences there. We've talked about a couple of them in very atopic children or children who have asthma, comorbidities, um, that maybe a targeted biologic agent would be more appropriate, as well as in long-term treatment. Um, do you have any other uh, sound bites or discussions when you're trying to choose between a JAK inhibitor or a targeted biologic agent? Um, what do you emphasize when you when you discuss this with parents or you know to distinguish between making the decision with either one of those classes the balance we have to do um for the specific situation of the patient will lead to the therapeutic principle that is best um and this is a lot of medical issues but this is also issues of drug availability. This is issues of the um, setting you are living in. If you are in a low resource setting uh, where people can maybe afford only methotrexate and even cyclosporin would already be too expensive, um, then you don't have the choices that luckily uh, we would have uh, in the US, in Canada or in Europe. Yes, I agree. And it is, I think it's important uh, to understand the all related risks, but also understand that these risks are very rare in healthy pediatric population with atopic dermatitis and serious side effects are related to older people with various comorbidities. Regarding the question of side effects of JAK inhibitors, uh, in pediatric patients, usually none of the risk factors is present. So um, in general speaking, a pediatric patients tolerate not only the JAK inhibitors, but also most of the traditional immunosuppressants better than the elderly patients do. Are, are you speaking across all drug classes or are you just, are you specifically talking about JAK inhibitors? I address the JAK inhibitors, but what we address would also uh, be true, for example, for cyclosporin um, or for methotrexate, which is astonishingly well tolerated in the pediatric population as well, even if it's completely off label, uh, not just in my home country, uh, but all around the world. 
do you think you're choosing, by and large, in general, uh, targeted biologics for children with atopic dermatitis over um, less specific immune suppressants like JAK inhibitors, cyclosporin, uh, you know, if you're, if you're not forced to do that by regulatory agencies, or, or, or which one do you have more patients on? In Croatia, I have more patients on JAK inhibitors because we do not uh, have registered dupilumab for atopic dermatitis yet. So we use it only in uh, pediatric patients uh, who uh, also has, have asthma. Very good example of access and how the politics of ac access uh, impacts, you know, what, yeah. what treatments are available. What about in Germany? There is a basic regulation that says that we should be cost effective in what we use to treat patients, which also applies to the use of systemic treatment. So if we decide to use systemic treatment, we have to look if we are cost effective. Um, and this is uh, looked at that we also have to keep in mind how effective is a drug and how safe is it. And this is why many, many physicians in my home country um, are using the uh, dupilumab as the first drug to start um, because it's licensed already from six months and above and has no licensed alternative present and for legal reasons, therefore, with all these patients, um, you would start with a biologic. As a take home message, atopic dermatitis in children is very common. And first line treatment is always with topical therapy, but there is an increasing awareness of the impact of moderate to severe disease on a pretty big po uh, proportion of children with this disease. And there is a need to recognize the importance of systemic therapy for this patient population. I wanted to thank my colleagues, Professors Pustacek and Wallenberg, for participating in this conversation with me. And I thank the audience for participating uh, in, in this discussion of the latest advances in treatment and management of atopic dermatitis in children.